at the end of the day, the goal for all the services is to make better citizens, right? We all come from all walks of life. We all did whatever we did before we came in the Marine Corps or in any service. Yeah, man, so uh, my name is Alex Cato. I'm uh, from Brooklyn, New York. Um, I joined uh, in July 11, 2005 is when I uh, officially became uh, a recruit, uh, Marine Corps Recruit Depot, Paris Island, South Carolina. Right now, I'm a first sergeant. Basically, I came an open contract. I didn't find out what my MOS was, so about, um, I want to say, a week and a half into MCT, so I, I became a uh, 3051 warehouseman. So, uh, born in, uh, basically into a uh, Dominican household, parents, uh, both my parents from the Dominican Republic. Um, when I was a year and a half, my father uh, was incarcerated in New York City due to uh, basically just soliciting narcotics, uh, distribution narcotics, things like that. A lot of... Uh, uh, drug drug dealers were getting hit hard with the Rockefeller law that was going on in New York City, and he was given 35 years of uh, imprisonment uh, due to the fact that he had prior to that, and he was only an, an alien at the time. So with that came a uh, deportation as well. So I was about a year and a half when that happened. Um, so basically grew up in a broken home, um, and uh, from time to time we'll visit my father uh, when he started out in. Um, and uh, I think it was uh, somewhere in Virginia, and then he would move to Pennsylvania. He moved a couple of times. Pennsylvania was the most time he did. Um, and of course, uh, lived three years in the Dominican Republic as well. When I was three to about six years old, came back to New York, didn't know a lick of English. I learned watching my, uh, or hearing my cousin speak, uh, even though I was, I would say American born. Um, and yeah, I lived with my grandparents for a bit. Uh, with my mother, my aunt, a couple of my cousins. They had a three-family home in Brooklyn. Uh, and yeah, so we moved around a bit here and there. But basically, uh, I was always surrounded by a lot of family at the end of the day. Uh, my family is massive, uh, probably like 100 deep in New York alone. Um, and then all the other families in, in New York City and all over the East Coast. But uh, thankful for that, uh, that they were definitely around. And um, it, was, uh, it was awesome. What I love about New York City and just Brooklyn in general is the fact that it's a, a melt, melting pot of many different uh, nationalities and backgrounds, right, ethnicities. So literally, it could be one block of all Dominicans, another block of Puerto Ricans, another block of Indians, another block of Guyanese, you name it. So every every block was like something different. It's just music blasting, the bodegas, things of, of uh, just many different things going on in, in a within a 10 block radius, uh, which was awesome, right, exposed to different things. But there was a lot of... Uh, bumps and uh just around there that things that you didn't want to be associated with so point that uh, i think in the late 90s early 2000s you go to school you can't even wear a, a color shirt because the the thing was like uh, you know they would be like what that what that what that color be like that was the the common thing either you were a latin king a blood a crib nieta different gangs that were uh, involved in new york city at the time and um was i uh, press to join, of course, all the time, especially Latin Kings. A lot of my, a lot of my close friends were Latin Kings. They wanted me to join so bad, uh, but I, I just didn't want to do any of that. Um, so when I was in high school, the good thing was that I had friends in all the gangs, so there wasn't an issue. And uh, there was a time when I was 14 years old, I was in the wrong place, wrong time, right? Uh, with a couple friends, uh, we went to the movies, we uh, uh, stayed to watch another movie, right? Kind of did one of those things and snuck into the other theater. We got out around nine o'clock, we were on the uh, projects area, it's called the Pink Houses in, uh, in Brooklyn. And um, whole, there was a whole bunch of kids, basically like in the stoop of the building. Um, and I was like, damn, I, I know something's gonna go down. Of course, you know, I'm 14, I got the freshest J's on, the 13s at the time. I got this chain, nice watch and stuff. I'm just, you know, a pretty boy, right? So uh, I tuck my chain in, uh, I'm with my cousin, um, one of my buddies and his sister. So it's four of us, two girls, two, two guys. And all of a sudden, out of nowhere, this one kid does a 360 and just not uh, chocks me right in the jaw, and I just you know crumble down. And all I feel is like at least probably like a, a dozen dudes on me, just stomping me out, just taking my stuff. My chain gets yanked. I'm surprised they didn't take my sneakers, right? <laughs> they were so clean. Um, we get up, and I'm just like fuck, just dazed and confused. I'm like, what the fuck just happened? The girls are okay, obviously, you know, beat up me and my uh, my friend. Um, but now we just keep walking and sure enough, these motherfuckers come out of nowhere. They're in bikes now and pegs and shit. So looking for, for us, I guess. And I was like, you gotta be kidding me. I'm like, God, what I did to deserve this tonight. So kind of branch off, 
And uh, they, my knee was all banged up. This dude's probably like 100 pounds heavier than me, catches up to me and throws me on the ground. They're building like a Burger King in the area. And he hits me with a trash can like three times. Like, this is WWE, some shit, right? Uh -huh. <laughs> so at that point, he takes my wallet um, and a couple of the things I have in my pocket. And, uh, and then they go from there. There was a house party going on down the block from that. So one of the girls was able to go there and get some people that came out. They assessed what's going on. They called the police. The ambulance came over. Took us to the but I had this huge knot on my forehead, um, and just my knee was all messed up. I remember being in the hospital. Um, they called our parents. My mom came through. I guess she told me afterwards that my uh, my back was facing the glass door, and she was just like, "Oh my God, they they destroyed him." You know, his face was all beat up because she didn't know what really happened, and she's all bawling and out of control. Until she finally saw me, so that it wasn't as bad as she thought it was. But she, you know, and of course she yelled at me, like, what were you doing there? Things like that, in Spanish. I was like, mom, it's okay, you know, we're alive, that's all that matters. So going back to the whole gang thing, uh, I was like, uh, it was orientation for high school uh, for the next upcoming year. So I was going into my 10th grade. I show up, one of my boys, he's, uh, he's a blood. He's like, yo, Alex, I heard what happened, man. He's like, just let me know. Fuck it. I don't care who was there or not. I'll shoot up the whole fucking block. And I was like, whoa, dog. I was like, it's not that serious. Like, I'm okay, man. Like, I don't give a fuck about that shit. He's like, well, the option's out there. Just let me know. So that's the, the exposure I had in friends and all, and all the gangs that they were down to just shoot up the block for me, I guess. Wow, <laughs> yeah. man. A lot of it had to do with my mother, right? I saw her, the struggles she went through, obviously, as being a single mother and just growing up and just doing the right things and just hustling for her, her kids, her kids at the end of the day. So I definitely owe a lot, a lot of that to her because she's, you know, always embracing uh, me to just do the right thing, right? Not to let myself be influenced by others and to just uh, be drawn to what everybody else is doing. So that's why, kind of, um, never want to be involved in that. And then I had a lot of. A lot of uncles that I looked up as, to, as fathers, they were worked hard as well, business owners, and just working hard and, hard and just taking care of their kids. So that's kind of, I think, what uh, kept me away from going on in that route. And as well, other friends as well, and environment that I was in high school. Uh, during high school, I was part of a JROTC, Air Force JROTC, that kind of kept me grounded as well because it put that military structure in me. You know, we're a bunch of high school kids playing military, right? Yeah. Which was cool, and uh, and it kind of kept me focused on, uh, on uh, you know, the future, basically. So um, I think as a kid, I always wanted to be uh, some type of law enforcement or I could wear a uniform, right? Not specifically the, the military. I think I wanted to be a policeman, man, YPD. Um, but once I get, got into high school, I joined the AFJ ROTC in my high school. And I was like, oh, the military, oh, this seems pretty cool. You know, at the beginning, I didn't want to wear the uniform. I remember when I signed up for it, it was uh, Captain Duarte. was one of the uh, uh, senior instructors for the JROTC. Uh, he came in. And like, hey, let me show you guys what the Gerald T's all about. You know, we do all this stuff. You got to wear a uniform once a week. I remember signing up for you get electives and things of that nature. And if you join, you come, uh, you go in as a higher pay grade to the military. So I joined, right? And then I got my uniform issued to me. I was like 14 years old. And I remember the first week I had to wear it, I was like, oh, this is embarrassing wearing this uniform. And then other kids making fun at me of me. I was like, man, I don't know if I want to do this. You know, the peer pressure. But after a while, I started getting to know... Um, the 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 other students that were involved in it and we became it was a brotherhood uh, within it uh the girls and the guys in in the JROTC so um the longer I stayed in the, you know I moved up in rank it had different positions within it it uh, and instilled some discipline in me and I was like man I want to do this actually so I wanted to join the Air Force obviously I'm an Air Force ROTC but they were like, yeah, it's about a year and a half wait to after you graduate. Like, nah, I'm good. So then I uh, talked to the Army National Guard. They were like, yeah, we'll give you 30K, but as a guard. I was like, that's for pussies, right? <laughs> so I was like, I don't want any of that. Then I had a couple, uh, uh, one of my buddies, uh, 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 Lewis, he joined the Marine Corps in 2003. So two years before I joined, he was in an infantryman. And I remember he came back from boot camp and, he, you know, he's locked and cocked. And I'm like, yo, this guy is legit. But I want to say, well, a couple months after that, they did his whole pipeline. He did three deployments, like back to back. And uh, I was an infantryman during the invasion and all the Fallujah was involved and all that. He changed, mindset changed, and you know, I, I saw what it did to him. As a Lance Corporal, the guy had already a NAM on a combat V, already multiple, I'm sure, of course, kills it on his, on his belt. So he did things like that. So 
he joined. Then a year later, my best friend Aníbal Delgado, who is the, is the first arm right now, actually, he joined as well. Another infantryman, you know, that joined. And then, you know, he's coming back telling me all his stories and stuff. And he does this couple of deployments. And I'm like, man, I want to be like those guys. I want to be a fucking Marine. So it was not many of us that joined the Corps out of that AFJ ROTC, but the uh those of us that did that it, it, you could tell the difference between the guys that went in the air force the army the navy obviously the marine corps the the discipline and just how we were just uh just locked you know i guess brainwashed right that's what they call it when you're in the marine corps yeah. to that to that extent so that that set my path I, once i graduated i already knew so we had the same recruiter i was 16 years old it was like uh sasson banuelos uh, he's actually a civilian now he lives here in california I told him, like, hey, you got me, dog. He I can't talk to you right now. You're a minor, you know, when you're 17. Guys, literally for weeks uh, leading up to my 17th birthday, I tell him, hey, yeah, I'm turning 17, turn 17. He's like, all right, man. I, I, he like, you better not be shitting me. I'm like, I got you, man. I'm joining. Literally, two weeks after I turned 17, I was at MAPS already swore in. He's like, he was like, you were the easiest contract I had. You came after me. I didn't think after, after you, right? So that was awesome. Obviously, uh, so yeah, that, that basically sealed, sealed the deal as becoming a Marine. There was nothing really available what I wanted. I wanted Motor T M, or uh, to be an MP, but for MPs, you got to be 19. I was 17 so when I was shipping, so Motor T, I think they wanted a license. I didn't have my license, but there was like some other things going on. So he convinced me to go open contact, of course, which, you know, looking back now, uh, I don't regret because it it uh everything to me happens for a reason and it got me to where i'm at today so if it wasn't for that open contract i don't think i will be the marine i am today mm. um so yeah one open contract obviously on july 10th i shipped out to uh, mcrd uh paris island and uh and then the next day it started getting paid so i remember uh we we're at maps right getting ready to go it's a lot of us from new york city so the majority of us were all hispanics right so we're all talking about like, oh, how's it gonna be? Things like that nature. So we uh, we arrive in Paris. We arrive at the airport. We get picked up. Get on the bus, right? We get to uh, we're on the bus, and I'm just like nervous as fuck. I'm just like, wow, what the what the fuck am I getting myself into? So I got my collar shirt on and stuff, and and sure enough, John Smith comes in. He gets a spill. You know, welcome to Paris, South Carolina. Blah, blah blah. He's like, hey, from now on, it's sir, no sir, I sir, things of that nature. He's like, get off my bus, get on the yellow footprint. Get on and it's just like and it starts right the yelling the going the spitting and all that stuff they put us in, in that that main uh after the double doors right this is, this is the first and last time you ever come through these doors um and the uh the metal uh uh tables and whatnot so we're in there for hours right they're doing paperwork i'm like in and out of conscious asleep right drooling on myself and i don't know what's going on <laughs> and then just 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 Come in, right? So the initial issue starts. I start issuing all that shit. And start yelling, 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 and then uh, um, I remember we're in receiving now. So I remember our receiving drill instructor. <laughs> this guy was like, I guess he didn't give a fuck. He was on his way out of DI duty or something. But he's like, hey guys, super chill. He's like, look, I'm not your drill instructor. I was here for the week until you get picked up. And um, yeah, he's like, you know, just get ready. You, can, you guys gonna be Marines. Just like nonchalant, you guys gonna be Marines. I remember he was a staff sergeant. He's talking about drinking beers and shit. I'm like, what the fuck is this guy talking about? <laughs> so I remember this one guy comes in as a, as a staff sergeant. He starts um, asking questions like, hey, who speaks a different language? Blah, blah, blah. So I'm like, yeah, I speak Spanish. Blah, blah. And so I'm like, he's like, oh, you know, I'm like, who the fuck is this guy? So no shit, a week later, it's, it, that was, that's my senior journal instructor, Sasson Farrell, you know? He's always doing his spiel, you know, I'm the senior journal instructor, all this stuff, and and, uh, and it begins, boom, the the chaos. So we had Sasson Farrell, who retired as Sergeant Major. I've only bumped into him once when he was the first sergeant in Afghanistan, a uh, great guy. Um, and we had uh, Sergeant Mystic Man and uh, Sergeant, um, uh, uh, what was it, Gonzalez? Uh, yeah, I want to say that was his name. And uh, these guys were a terror. Mystic Man, we couldn't pronounce his name at the beginning. He was like, don't fucking do it. He's like, I'm just drill instructor. Do not attempt to you know, call me my fucking name because everybody's butch butchering it up. <laughs> so this guy was insane. So one story I do go back to. So I got a couple, actually. I'll say two. That way we, we, we move it on. So there was one time I was going to the head, right? And I don't know why. He was just standing there, uh, Sergeant Mystic Man. I just kind of like sized him up. And now he's like, oh, good bitch. He's like, come here. So he yoked me out 
while the other drones took the came over, <laughs> over and just, they literally started just going in on me, just punching me in the stomach, stuff like that. He's like, bitch, you think you tough, huh? He's like, where you from? I'm like, from Brooklyn, sir. He's like, oh, motherfucker, you think you're in the hood, right? You sizing me up? So they just fucked me up. And they're like, go, bitch, go to the head. So I was like, oh, wow, okay. So I was like, you know, I'm like, I sir. And I took my licks and just kept it going. <laughs> and then one time, um, uh, he was the, the duty drone instructor for that day. I think it was a Sunday. And we were already go, going to the range at PI. So we had to move squad base to go a couple miles on the road on the base. And we're moving slow and all that stuff. I don't know. I guess he was just having a bad day or something. This fucking dude lost his goddamn mind. He destroyed. He made his dump everything on uh, in the center of the thing. He would just he started putting uh, shaving cream all over the windows. Just fucking everything up. I think it's impossible for one man can do so much fucking damage to a fucking build to a, a, a squad bay and just of uh, what 110 marines in the platoon or something and it was insane this guy lost his fucking mind we put everything in the center he's all right now fucking crumble all up put it all together he brought uh the guy down he's like i'm put monster bachi up in this motherfucker and he just climbed all the fucking shit that was everywhere and just put the uh the guy down up there and he's like, all right, bitches, you guys got 10 minutes to put everything. He's like, I don't give a fuck who it belongs to, who it goes to, put it in a fucking bag. So we're 10 minutes, we just clean it up, put, it, put everything away, put it away, put it away. And this dude was like, all right, now let's get ready to load all this shit in the truck. It took me three weeks to get my debit card back because I didn't know where the fuck it was. I was wearing somebody else's underwear and shit like that. It was just so fucking disgusting. It was just complete chaos. This dude... I, I I give it up to him though. He he put in that work that day. I think that was uh, yeah. His, obviously, he's just way of getting the frustration now. But that that, that fucking that drill instructor was fucking wild. Yeah. He was out of control. Wow. <laughs> After like what fifty something hours going through the crucible, getting just no sleep, and obviously you're hungry, tired, and, and just came the moment right that it was over. And it was uh, you know they're handing us our eagle one anchor, and it was just an emotional moment, right? This, that's the, the point that we, we earned the title, right? We, the rite of passage, uh, as the many would say. And it, uh, it was just a lot of emotions going flowing through my body and stuff. You know, obviously tears coming down your cheek and, and you're just there. You get the whole spill from the first sergeant in regards to earning the title. And it was like, wow, like I made it, right? I didn't think I was going to make it. The moments that I thought I was going to either get dropped or have to recycle, go to another platoon, whatever the case was. But my main focus was like everything I did, every time I did an event, it was like, I got to graduate. I got to see my mom. I was like, I got I to see her at the day I was told I was going to graduate. I can't stay here any longer. So it, uh, it was exciting, definitely. Yeah. I graduated October 7, 2005. Literally a week later on October 14, I turned 18. So it was perfect. I was on boot leave at my house, turning 18 years old. I remember my cake, the surprise my aunt, she, uh, she surprised me. They did a, uh, they printed out my boot camp picture and they put it on the cake. So I was like, oh, that's pretty cool, you know? And I'm wearing my ring and stuff, my, my uh, boot camp ring, and it was awesome. Uh, so yeah, a couple of days passed after that and um, I went to uh, to uh, MCT over at New River and Camp Geiger at North Carolina. So that was the whole three week thing. We we did stuff there, and I, that's when I found out about a week, two weeks later that I wore my MOS was thirty fifty one warehouseman. So I, MCT was cold as hell. It was November two thousand five, and you know they're still fucking us too. We're getting haze too. I remember my platoon sergeant at MCT dirtbag straight up. The first thing he told us when he when he picked us up was like. He's like, yeah, I'm sad strong, whoever, however, um, you know, your platoon sergeant. He's like, I'm what you call a dirtbag in the a dirtbag staff sergeant in the Marine Corps. I was just like, wow, like what does you know what does that even mean? Uh, what are you trying to say? But you know, obviously later on you learn what that is. And I was like, this is the first you know interaction you get really with a fleet Marine and tell my staff and CEO, and that's what they want to leave you a lasting impression they want to leave as you you're literally a couple months into your career as as a Marine. Um, so yeah, MCT. And then uh, after MCT, it was November 22nd, I remember, got on a bus, went to Camp Johnson, which is just a couple blocks away, uh, to, to check in uh, there to start, uh, obviously, awaiting training for MOS school. So it was uh, Thanksgiving uh, weekend, so a lot of people were gone for 96. The base was extremely empty, little base, right, where all the service support schools go to. And um, it was just weird there. And... Um, that's, I think, other than boot camp, that's when I first got hazed uh, there, right? We had this, uh, this sergeant and um, 
And a couple of the Marines, they were like just basically received as while people came out from 96. I remember um, it was like one of the nights uh, they were like, hey, move all the tables and stuff. So they might have to do flutter kicks and stuff like that. And we're like, oh, it was like boot camp stuff, right? Like it was just IT, right? <laughs> but little did we know, we were actually getting hazed. And one Marine said something and opened up an investigation. Sure enough, that sergeant got, uh, got relieved and eventually separated from the Marine Corps because. What she was doing is she was hazing us. Uh, it was just like, it was crazy. Uh, wow. and I didn't even know that. I thought it was just, we were just training, right? So, wait, wait, just from doing physical? So, yeah, so we're doing physical training inside a, not even, it wasn't even a physical environment. We're talking about at 20 hundred at night, you know, wearing camis and stuff, and we're just getting instruction for the next day. And I guess she didn't like what we were doing, whatever the case was. She said, hey, move all the tables out of the way in this uh, large classroom. And then she was, yeah, make us do push-ups, do flutter kicks, whatever the case was. And obviously she's not doing it with us. You're making people do something that you're not doing yourself. So that's when they, you, uh, you cross the lines in regards to hazing. Wow. I was there for a couple of months at Camp Johnson. I graduated. Um, I actually requested order to go to Camp Lejeune because I want to be close to the East Coast to New York, right? At least go home every often, so often. So, uh, to come time to graduation, they're like, "Hey, all you guys, you guys are going to one Yankee Nine, the MCC." I'm like, "What the hell is that?" They're like, "Camp Pendleton." I'm like, "What the fuck? I don't want to go to Cali. I've never been to Cali." And um, that's too far from New York, you know. <laughs> like, I can't go home on the weekends like that. So I remember arriving at San Diego International, the USO. We all get on the uh, the time Cloud Nine bus and drives us to Camp Pendleton uh, to uh, main side to the Joint Reception Center, the JRC, right? And um, there's a corporal on duty because like 2300 at night. I forgot what day of the week it was, and um, I didn't even know what the hell you know I was going to. It's just we get there and then we're supposed to go to the the G Pack the next the next day. So the the Group Personal Administrative Center at the time for MLG. Um, the Marine Logistics Group. And then uh, we get there, and I remember talking to the corporal. He's like, hey, where you from? And I'm talking about, I'm from New York, Dominican. He was actually Dominican, dude. So I was like, damn, the first Dominican I meet in the fleet, right? And corporal, so that was pretty cool. And um, yeah, so then the next day we go to the GPAC, and they're like, hey, you and you know another uh, Marine, uh, you guys have orders, uh, TD orders to go to March Air Reserve Base. I was like, what the hell is that? Uh, like, yeah, you know, you'll find out. You got to go to the math and check in. But originally, I was supposed to go to CLR 17, uh, Combat Logistics Regiment 17 there on the first MLG. So I check in with them. I checked them to check out. So I don't even know the people. They're like, yeah, check in, check out. And then you got to go to the math over at Del Mar and check in with them. So we get there. I'm a PFC. Um, they're like, yeah, we need, we, we need bodies. So... Well, that's what they. That's what the MEF does. They send out uh, a feasibility a support request, and they're like, "Hey, whatever, pick, pick random Marines like to go support them." So they picked myself, my buddy Palmer, uh, that we're still great friends to this day, and we go there. We check in. This is Gunny there. Um, he's like, "Hey, you guys are gonna go to March Air Force Base in Riverside, uh, or Moreno Valley, and you guys are gonna help us basically with all the uh, deployment redeployment. The Marines going in now, obviously a theater." And uh, we'll explain more when you get there, right? So, all right, cool. So, anyway, he takes on the drive, right? We're going on the 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 15 and the 215. And I'm like, wow, it's Cali, you know? And, you know, it's pretty cool. The mountains and stuff everywhere. So we get to uh, Moreno Valley. We see to the uh, March of Reserve Base, and then the barracks are uh, are off the base. So it's gated and stuff, kind of ghetto and stuff. I'm like, what the fuck is this a base? <laughs> so they had to put a pin code and stuff to drive in the barracks, all right? Uh, and then Sure enough, he's like, yeah, my counterpart is Staff Sergeant Tejeda. You know, he's, he's like, Ismael Tejeda. And, he, and then he's like, oh, because uh, I'm talking to the gunny on the way there. He's like, oh, he's actually Dominican. And I was like, shit, another Dominican, right? So here comes uh, Ismael Tejeda, freaking, which is still a great friend and mentor to me to this day. Uh, and he still lives out here. He comes to Ismael Tejeda, fucking chewing on some, uh, on, uh, some fries from, uh, what is it called, uh, Carl's Jr. He's like, you know, Indian's fries, like, what's up, biatch? And I was like, what the fuck? <laughs> so he's like, uh, you know, he's like, uh, hey, what's going on, Seth? You know, uh, PFC Caro and then Palmer, or whatever. And then this dude is like, he's like, where you from? You know, I'm telling him, he's like, Dominicano, huh? He's like, Calo, okay, all this shit. Just tell you, talking to the, and I just felt weird. I'm like, oh, shit, I'm talking to a staff. But he's, they're both reservists activated, though. So they've been in a minute, you know, and uh, older guys, obviously, uh, on, are activated to do this, this mission. And uh, so that that was like my first introduction, not really the fleet, but I guess it's just the Marine Corps overall. And they were cool. We did that for about four months. And then um, 
they kept asking, you know, from our unit, they're asking, hey, you guys want to deploy? And I was like, fuck yeah, let's do this shit. So those orders were cut short. Then I went back to CLR 17 to start doing that stuff. Once I got back, they were like, hey, we're going to TD you to CLB5. You'll deploy with them to Al-Assad. Uh, you know, I was do supply with them. So I was like, all right, cool. So I got TD to CLB5 the month prior to deployment. And, um, and then we deployed. Once literally we landed in Al-Assad, um, I was a Lance Corporal at the time. Um, some, some Marine comes out of nowhere that, hey, it's Lance Corporal Gatto here in the group. And I was like, hey, what's up? It's me. He's like, hey, you're going to get TED to uh, uh, Provisional Security Platoon in, um, in Altacatum. And I'm like, what the fuck is that? You know, I don't know what the hell any of this shit means. And they're like, yeah. So I'm like, how the hell I get TED to TED to TED? They're like, what? this makes no damn sense. So I'm literally waiting in the airfield. They're like, we don't know when we can get a flight for you to get you out. For, day, for like three days, no shower, brushing my teeth, because I can't leave the terminal. I'm just eating MREs, just feeling like shit. And then finally, they're like, yeah, we're going to get you in a Blackhawk out there. This is Sandstorm. I'm like, oh, the Blackhawk can't take off. I'm like, whatever. That would have been pretty cool. You know, first time in Blackhawk. So I'm like, all right, we got a C-130 now. So again, a C-130 first time. No, actually second time, because on the way to Al-Assad, I got into a C-130 because we flew from Kuwait there. And... Um, so I got on C-130, get to uh, Altacatum, the airfield, and then two Marines picked me up in green on green. I'm like, who the fuck are these dweebs? So but it was a staff sergeant, a lieutenant. <laughs> so it was actually uh, the staff in CUIC for the provisional security platoon and then one of the platoon commanders. So it was basically uh, broken into two platoons. Uh, we we're about maybe 200 Marines deep. So they explained to me what, what our mission was. So it provided ECP for the base, uh, the entry control point. Okay. Uh, so the primary uh, entry to the base. So we'll search vehicles, trucks, uh, a lot of convoys that'll come through, obviously, uh, that will come and pass through the base. And then, because that was one of the main hubs of the economy when it came to logistics and things of that nature. Um, as well, uh, we, we did, uh, we were uh, we were actually attached to a, a guard unit, an army guard unit from Minnesota, the Bearcat 2 to the 136, so a mouthful, right? Um, so they, they were really like our next chain of command, and then obviously the Marine Corps with them, um, uh, one meth. So they did, we did patrols as well with them, we went outside the wire, we did QRF, things of that nature. So I got to do a little bit of all the components of, of the provisional security platoon. I started out ECP. A lot of things, uh, yeah, we just saw them in search trucks. A lot of guys would come in. We would uh, x-ray their bodies, make sure they didn't have anything, search their vehicles. I remember one time we found $10,000 in this guy's, uh, in his um, in steering wheel, basically in the center. We popped, we would pop him open and stuff. He had 10000 I was just like, fuck. So, you know, me and my buddies were like, damn, this guy didn't declare this shit, right? But it was, we didn't know how much they could bring in. And we're like you know, what's the right thing to do, right? So, you know, some of the other guy Marines like, yo, let's just take the money, fuck it, split it amongst us. And I was like, nah, I don't know, that shit doesn't come back to us. So we called it in, like, hey, this guy has 10K on him. So I was like, yeah, he, that's legal for him to bring, you know, I guess the money he just collected over time. Um, so whatever, we didn't, we didn't touch it, we left it in there. It just, it's funny, he was hiding it, right? He was hiding the money, and uh, of course, we're young Marines, so like, let's yeah. take the money, right? Yeah. But no, nah, we, we didn't do it. Um, we, <laughs> did the, we did the right thing, and... Uh, so there was a time that um, that now I was doing like kind of uh, patrolling, which is, that's what they call it, right? We'll go out, just just uh, do random convoys, drive around uh, a couple hundred miles out from uh, out to Cod and all that stuff. So we would go down um, the main was like IED Valley, which we basically called it was called Long Island, the stretch from uh, out to Cod, I think, to like Ramadi, I believe. And um, and we would just do random stuff. We would do the snap vehicle uh, checkpoints, uh, things of that nature. I remember this one time, we did we did uh, we we're doing checking vehicles uh, far out, and this one guy, um, he popped his trunk too soon before he got to the to the to his turn, and our inter our interpreter, um, this dude was like seventy years old, freaking skin and bones. He was like, you know, just yelling at this dude in Arabic. He's like, what the fuck are you doing? And I was like, oh shit, this is, this is it. We're going to get blown up right now, you know? And he's yelling at this dude, like, just going out. He pulled him out the car, he whooped his ass in front of all of us. And I'm like, oh shit, what the fuck going on? This like 80 year old man just whooping this guy's ass because he popped his trunk too soon. <laughs> so that was the funniest thing I ever seen. And we were taking videos, you know, so he's whooping his ass and stuff. I forgot what his name was. They were like, yo, chill out, man. He's like, no, fuck that dude, you know? He's fucking, we don't know 
what the fuck's going on. We could, you know, you guys could open fire on them, whatever the case is. And uh, so here we are, a whole bunch of pogs, right? We're all playing infantry. That's sort of what, a whole bunch of supply, motor T guys. And, and uh, it's just the Marine Corps needed bodies to do things like that. Right? I didn't care what your MOS was, right? You're a trigger puller at the end of the day. Yeah. So... We're doing all this, you know, infantry stuff uh, out on the wire and shit. And I didn't even do any training leading up to that because I wasn't supposed to do any of that. But a lot of the uh, the Marines already there, they went through ITX and they had, like a lot of things to learn, you know, basic infantry skills, right? More than what we just learned at MCT. Uh, so that that was that was an interesting moment right there. Uh, and I was like, you know, th this is this is Iraq, right? Never saw any like physical combat right uh while while out there outside the wire but did some interesting thing we did one time take in some um some uh detainees because we did get some guys that uh they did uh they have fake ids they were mirroring the same uh, identification numbers and they were kind of suspicious they did have residue on their hands in regards to like uh explosion uh materials to make explosions things like that so we did bring those guys in so i was cool we took uh obviously pictures of that and um I remember one time out of nowhere, we were just bored and stuff, right? So we were like in the middle of the fucking desert, right? And all the fuck, let's just do a range, right? So we just start shooting 203s and shit. I don't know, it's just a whole bunch of random craziness. And I, I had blown up vehicles and they're like, just because whatever. They called in like, hey, we're just going to do a range. And we started shooting and stuff. And that was cool. And then this one time, there was a vehicle coming while we were doing the range. I don't know where this dude's coming. And we're like, what the fuck? What is this random car here in the middle of the desert? So... Pull him over, you know, and start talking to him. He just lost or whatever the case is. So his vehicle is uh, right side drive, right? And I was like, this is interesting. I've never driven a vehicle on the right side. So I was like, hey, Stas, you mind if I drive his car real quick? It's standard. I know how to drive a little standard. And he's like, fuck it, get in that thing. So I just started driving around the desert. Just <laughs> right? Um, and then at the last story in regards to this, uh, um, we we're doing a night op. So we had to go blackout, uh, you know, MVGs and stuff. Mind you, I never trained anything to lead up to this appointment. So, like, I was a driver, and they're like, hey, Carol, we're putting our nods on and shit. We're going blackout, turn the uh, the uh, IR light on for the vehicle. And I'm like, I've never driven with fucking MVGs on. Like, this is the most weirdest shit I've ever done. It's a pitch black, you know? So, I'm trying to look at my peripheral, but I can't. I'm supposed to move my head because I have the, I forgot what PBS this was, but it's just the one, you know, out. It's not the double lens and stuff. So, I'm over here trying to like look this way, but I'm supposed to turn my whole fucking head to turn, right? You know, so it's just weird. And then by out of nowhere, I'm on this fucking hill because I don't know where the fuck I'm at. And my truck just starts sliding to the left. I'm like, what the fuck's going on? So we go down and uh, and we get out, right? Turn on the lights and my truck is just stuck. All this, like at least probably like three feet deep in, in sand. And we're trying to get this bitch out, get it out. And just the engine's about to give out. And we're all right, let's bring out a, a tow, you know, a uh, like this huge ass rope to see if we can pull it out with the other truck. So, um, all right, they're like, all right, get in the truck. When we tell you, gun it, gun it, right? So the other truck is pulling, and I'm over here gunning. The truck is, this thing's going, it weighs probably, you know, a couple thousand pounds. And I remember it comes out of the dirt and it just whoop lasts the truck and almost hit a fucking marine that's right there. And I was like, holy shit, this shit could have turned out bad. But luckily, we got the truck out. It was all no harm, no foul. And we went back to driving, you know, blackout. And I was like, blackout. And I'm like, this is fucking crazy. <laughs> things happen for a reason, right? I learned so much in that deployment, yeah. made some great friends. And I got to do things that I never thought I would be able to do. Um, even uh, when I even I did QRF, I got called out. We got called out a couple of times to go uh, recover vehicles or recover personnel. Vehicles got blown up. Even there was even a fucking uh, uh, a track, so a AV that was, uh, the track came off. So we had to go recover those personnel and all that. So remember, we're we're an hour away from getting off shift, the twelve hour shifts, and we get the call like, hey, you got uh, you guys need to come recover a vehicle and a couple of people. And they're like, damn, we're about to get off. They're like, nope, you guys gotta come right now. It was like fucking, I think it was like 05 in the morning. It was like 06 to, zero to 1800, the shifts, then the 1800 06. They're like, fuck. So, all right, we mounted it up. It was literally like a three, four hour drive. I was fucking tired as fuck. I've been up for since my shift started. So, we get there, it's like, it's like probably like 11 o'clock, right? And, um, and I'm just exhausted, and I'm like, I told my staff, I'm like, I can't drive back, man. Like, I'm, I've been up for almost a full, full fucking day. 
there's no way. I'm like, I'm going to fall asleep. He's like, I got you, man. He's like, I'll drive. He's like, just sit in the back. He's like, you can crash out if you want. I fucking crash. We got back at the fucking 3 o'clock in the afternoon to go take another nap to come back at 1800, right? For our, our regular shift. We just did a fucking two fucking shifts, basically. Yeah. <clears throat> so just things like that will happen yeah. here and there. But it was, again, it was interesting. It, uh, it definitely was, a, uh, was an awesome, awesome deployment. I didn't deploy again to to 20, 2012 to Afghanistan, uh, and that was 2006 to seven. I was in Iraq, and then a couple of years had passed. I'm deployed again to uh, 2012. And the reason was because after that deployment, um, I signed up to go on a, to be a Marine security guard. So for three years, mm. I was I was doing that duty. So a uh, Marine security guard was I think other than being a first sergeant, that was the highlight of my single career in in the Marine Corps. Right? Uh, I remember I had one of my sergeants, she went and she did it, uh, she signed up and I was like, man, why not? I'm, I'm 20 years old, I'm a corporal, travel the world, right? This is pretty, seems like a great program. Signed up, got approved, went to school, did all that, graduated. Um, and then uh, my first post was Doha, Qatar. So, you know, obviously the mission of the Marine Security Guard is to protect classified material and personnel and, and, uh, and, um, and the structure right, of the U.S., the embassies that we support, consulates. So I think that's like the, the hidden secret that, uh, that many Marines know about it, but they don't know about it, really what, what they do. And, um, and I think it's the only program that the, the Marine Corps is the only one that has it, that does it, then the, any, and all the branch has this program. Um, I think it's so lucrative, right? So I went to Doha, Qatar, my first post, and here we are, you know, we're, we're, the, we're considered ambassadors in blue. Uh, we're just safeguarding the embassy right then. So we have 24 7 shifts, uh, basically, and we break it up in whatever it is the size of the detachment, right? Of course, we get days off and things like that, but if they're eight hour shifts at, the, at their my, uh, time on the program. And I'm, I'm, I'm in Doha, Qatar. Um, you know, Doha's still booming up and coming. 2008, when I got there in August, obviously the hottest shit is the fucking Middle East. Same thing as Iraq. Iraq's only a couple hours away uh, in a flight. And um, but Middle Eastern country, but it's awesome. There's a lot of things going on. A lot of things are happening. And um, um, I think uh, I met a lot of people in that just that first post alone. Uh, Dignitary made uh, met General Petraeus when he was the commander of all U.S. forces in Iraq and things like that. A lot of uh, the CNO, um, you name ambassadors from other countries and dignitaries and whatnot. Uh, I remember one uh, incident that did occur at the embassy uh, was that one time I think we were sleeping right, and um, all I remember the alarm went off right. I'm like, what the fuck is a drill? You know, because we were having surprise drills. And I know like, this is a real incident. We, we have an anthrax uh, in the compound. We're like, oh shit! So we put up our. We we were at the house. The house is literally uh, two a couple feet away from the the main chancery building, the embassy building. So we all load up. We we put our trash bags on. You know, we tape up and stuff. Put our mask on, a mask uh, gas mask on, and we go into the embassy, and we start evacuating people that weren't in that surrounding area where the exposed um, you know anthrax was at. So what had happened, one of, one of the embassy employees that opened up a letter and a whole bunch of just like um, powder came out of it. So she's like, hey, I think uh, I just opened up a letter that has anthrax. And you know, anthrax is still a big thing around that time, 09. So like, oh shit. So I would start saying decon areas, that stuff. We have people in the embassy that are, are part of the decon team. And, um, but there's some people that can't leave because they were exposed to it. So I think that's, that's kind of set everything up. So for, I think maybe... 10 hours on, I was on a mob level four, full gig. I had no water in my canteen because again, I was an idiot, didn't put any water in it. I thought we were never gonna do anything like that. So I'm, at, I'm on the third floor of the embassy building and I see people doing stuff, you know, deconning people and whatnot. Finally, the, uh, the hazmat team from Qatar, they come in, assess the situation, and they, they, they deem it clear. It wasn't any actual anthrax. I guess when that, Letter went through the feeder at the USPS, whatever the case was. A lot of some papers are shredded into like very thin powder, like so it got into that letter, and that's what that's what uh, started all that. But we act, you know, we did what we we trained for, we executed, and it was great. We were all awarded yeah. for that, so it, it was. 
things like that. Um, so I obviously went through uh, MSG school, which is in Quantico, Virginia. That was seven weeks long. So we learned what, what the uh, basic, what a basic Marine security guard does, right? In regards to uh, how, do we, how do we conduct ourselves overseas to how do we operate the systems that we use at, uh, at the post, post one or multiple posts that the embassy may have, again, depending on the size of it. We do drills, different scenarios, things like that, how to operate weapons. We shot the M4, the M9, Uzis, things like that. We shot uh, gas canisters from, um, we also shot the Remington 870 shotgun uh, from it. So we learn how to use different weapons, how to employ them, how to uh, subdue uh, individuals if it came to that. Obviously, what the deadly force, how to use it, if we had to use it. I've never been through OC training. I remember just seeing a couple of Marines go through it. Just you, I saw grown men, like 200 pounds, just crumble like women. I don't want, I'm not sorry. Just crumble in general. And uh, it was just like, wow, like my turn's coming up. And then, uh, so then I get hit with the spray and I was just like, fuck. I dropped to a knee and I'm just like, this can't be happening right now. I get up. He's like, how many fingers do I have? Uh, you know, he has up. I'm like three and I'm just like, God damn it. I'm trying to shake my head, trying to shake it off. So we'll go through the first part. Uh, the aspartame comes out and just start hitting it and get, get through. And it's just the worst pain. I think I've never been shot, but I think I'd rather get shot than go through it, uh, getting OC'd ever again. And uh, so we, I get through it, it's not coming all over me, just look like, like a bag of trash. And uh, I get sprayed with the water hose. And then as I'm getting sprayed, water is going into my, on my foot. So we're all in green on green. I got my PT shoes on and uh, my running shoes. And then literally minutes later, my foot is on fucking fire because the OC uh, uh, it's crossed over to my goddamn toes. And I was like, God damn it. So not only my face burning up, my feet burning up. I was like, fuck, it's the worst pain ever. Wow. Uh, yeah, so that, that was an interesting moment, <laughs> definitely. So, did, uh, so obviously MSG uh, occurred. My second post was Athens, Greece. Best, you know, best place I've ever been to. Mm. After that, I went to Abuja, Nigeria. So I got the best of everything. Obviously, Southeast Asia, Europe, and Africa. So that was cool. So it was time to get off MSG. Um, again, well, again, I advise any single Marine out there to, this is a must do. If you're gonna do five, 30 years of Marine Consistent Matter, it's a must do, right? So fast forward. Uh, I'm a sergeant now, and um, I get orders to 3-5 uh, uh, in Camp Pendleton. I decided I want a lap move, so I ended up lap moving to, uh, I got approved to a lap move into uh, 0431, which is embarkation specialist, logistics embarkation specialist. So um, I got approved for that, and uh, I'm a, so basically 3-5, they leave on the MU, and I'm just back in RBE, just waiting to go to MOS school. So I'm getting the run around to go to school, and sure enough, I find out, I guess I like the staff sergeant in my intended MOS. A job I've never done, I'm like, what the hell? So I'm like, cool. So they need IAs to go to Afghanistan to do the retrograde. We're trying to obviously decrease the footprint over there during that time. And um, I rogered up, I was like, hey, I'm down to go, right? So I go on leave and uh, I don't know what's going on. It's like October, it's around my birthday. I get a call that, hey, where you at? Like, they're looking for you. I'm like, who's looking for me? They're like, uh, uh, the IA that you you got approved for, like shit, I didn't know I got approved for that. They're like, hey, you need to come back. You're leaving in three weeks. I'm like, okay. I'm like, hey, mom, uh, I'm going to Afghanistan in three weeks. She's like, what the fuck? <laughs> She's like, I thought you said you were never going to deploy again. You lied to me the first time. And I'm like, here you go again. I was like, don't worry about it. I'm just going to be in the base, you know, doing uh, logistics and shit. Nothing's going to happen, right? Uh, and so I go, I check into the IA unit, and then we go to Afghanistan to retrograde. And I was, since you're 04, you know, you're going to be in 04, 31, and, um, and uh, your staffs aren't select, but like, we'll just put you with the embark section to get like OJT. So that's where I actually learned the, the trade, obviously, with the MOS I was going into. Obviously, it wasn't like an exciting deployment like Iraq was, but I never left. Uh, I was in, um, in Camp Leatherneck, never left, it, left there, but... We, we supported the, the retrograde, right? We sent back millions and millions of pieces of gear just to, of course, decrease the, the footprint there. I think we got hit with like two uh, in, indirect two indirect fires on the base. Nothing crazy, nobody got hurt, right? It was just, we had to muster and make sure everybody was good. But yeah, there was a lot of stuff to do in Bastion. I was, I was like the, the hub, right, of Afghanistan. Leatherneck, Bastion, because Bastion was the British side. 
So all these Brits be wild, out of control. The Dutch and the Brits were there. Like they were allowed to drink, do whatever the hell they wanted. I was like, man, we want to fucking drink too, but obviously we can't. So, but they did have uh, it's, it was called a Blue Cafe. It was like uh, they had Latin night, Latin night in Afghanistan in the combat zone. What the fuck is that, right? So, well, uh, every Sunday they had that. So obviously I'm, I'm Dominican. I'm gonna go out there. I met a ton of Dominicans out there from all the branches, and I even met a Dominican a Royal British soldier. So we were just hanging out, talking Spanish, playing dominoes and shit that Latin night. And this dude comes out of nowhere, uh, no, no, uh, British, uh, you know, soldier uh, uniform, and he's like, "Is hey, you guys Dominican?" Like, yeah, what's up? He's like, "Oh, I'm Dominican too." He's like, "Yo, hello, okay, okay. like, what the fuck?" <laughs> he's like, "Yeah, when I was like uh, four, my mom migrated to uh, to uh, London and stuff, and you know, here I am now, a British royal soldier." I was like, "That's fucking dope." So we took a group pick, right? Like, look, we got Dominicans, all the branches of service, even contractors, and even a fucking British royal soldier. And that's to show you that our footprint is massive around the around the world, all right? Uh, so we're being Latin, you know, dancing bachata, man, and go this shit. Literally, weapons just in the corner, just people, all fucking weapons. Like, we're in Afghanistan. In a sense, we kind of like, just kind of like, just, you know, you forget sometimes where you're at. And it's kind of like, just that, for that couple hours, just, you know, release whatever you're doing, work and stuff. And we just had a good time. That was it, you know. Yeah. So basically, uh, once I got selected uh, to first sergeant, um, so fast forward, selected first sergeant, I get ordered to third battalion, first marines. My first stint as a, as a first sergeant. Uh, talking to my mentor, he's like, "Look, you want to grind your teeth, right? You want to start off hard as, as a first sergeant." So he's like, "Infantry is the way to go." So I go to three one. I get Lima Company, and it was uh, it was an eye opener, right? I think for six months I was just drowning. On the on how to how, what is it that I do as a first sergeant, right? Because it's basically a lap move. You change your MOS, but you only go to a two weeks uh, school, right? And then you learn on the job. It's basically what it is, and you lean on the, all the other senior first sergeants, and they, and they they you know basically walking you through it. That was a lot of hurdles, right? A lot of Marines getting in trouble. We're training up for deployment. A lot of stuff happening, and just you getting drawn to things that that. Uh, that you wouldn't you you wouldn't want to be drawn right all the negative stuff um which is basically marines getting in trouble instead of all the positive that's happening within the battalion obviously we weeded out those individuals that didn't belong that didn't deserve the title and we just kept them moving and, and we trained hard for for our deployment that was coming up and um i honestly being a a a company first on an infantry battalion has been the highlight at this level so far of my career because it uh, it helped me grow and just seeing the growth of those Marines it was insane. Um, uh, what those uh, those Marines went through the heart, the adversity that we all faced as a company just overall just made us stronger a bond and we could be able to execute our mission if ever we came need to, to uh, operate of that. A uh, quick story: we're in ITX right, and we're doing the. Uh, the, uh, the MWX, the final exercise, right, the culminating event. So the, the exercise in, is intended to uh, to just bring adversity, right? To see how you react, how the company, the battalion reacts when facing those adversities. So one of those is that we went black on water uh, a couple of times, right? It was like 100 degrees out. And and we uh, the convoy, they were simulating convoys were being shot down, blown up. There was no water resupply. So we didn't have water, I think, for like 12 hours. And, and whatever water you had, which is burning hot in your canteen or whatever water bottle you had. Literally, I opened my, my canteen up and it was just steam coming out of that motherfucker. I was like, I'm not drinking this shit. She's hot as fuck. Like, you don't want to drink that, right? So we put cami netting on because a lot of IR going overhead. So we, we were hiding right from the enemy. And um, Marines just dropping left and right. Obviously, Corman trying to help them out and stuff like that, trying to rehydrate them, put them IVs. And I'm just like, fuck, I'm about to go down. I'm just weaving and bobbing. I'm just like, I can't write. I'm the first sergeant, right? It's supposed to be hard. So I'm just like, fuck, I'm tired as fuck. I'm thirsty. And then like a couple hours pass. And then finally, I see a fucking uh, um, a, a seven ton with a water bowl behind him. And I'm just like, hey, get that fucking razor. Let's get in the, in the, in the, in the razor and let's go get that fucking uh, water bowl. So they're, they're trying to help another uh, uh company that's out there, I think it was India company, and my boy Carlos is the first one over there, and they already had water and shit, and they were already, like, the company was already destroyed, they were like, I guess they got all killed and stuff in the simulation, 
So I go over there, I'm like, hey, Carlos, man. I was like, fuck you, man. I'm taking your water bowl. So I fucking take that water bowl back to our site. The Marines like, oh my God, first time you brought the fucking water. So I was like, let's fucking go. Come on, mount them. You know, everybody start getting water, your camelbacks, all that shit. Get that water in. And uh, and man, the, the instant, once that water hit that, that mouth, Marines is alive again because it was insane. But the, just things like that is what created adversity, right? And we, we overcame, overcame it by, by be, you know, being resilient, right? Yeah. And it uh, and just made us tighter as a whole. And uh, That's and what builds a camaraderie. Absolutely, 100%. The adversity does build camaraderie. And that's like kind of one of my biggest things when I say like my, so one of my, my mantra is stay hungry. To me, obviously, hunger feeds and breeds success, right? So with that, uh, you have to face adversity. You have to be resilient. And how you overcome those adversities will, will makes you the type of individual that, that you want to be, right? Um, and, and definitely build that camaraderie. I and mean, we were tight, tight uh, going into that deployment. So my company, we were the uh, the trap, the trap, uh, basically the uh, crisis response company, uh, part of the SP MAGTAB. So we were out of Kuwait and Al Jabber. So whatever, so we conducted, basically our mission was for trap. So the... Tactical recovery of aircraft personnel. So if obviously, th th uh, aircraft went down. We want to recover. Luckily, you know, we weren't execute. We didn't never execute the trap because if that happened. That means people were probably dead. So luckily, that never happened. Um, but we did train up to that, and we were always ready to go, right? And we were also the crash response. So if they need a contingency out there. If some shit went down. We were the guys. Lima Company was the company to go out there and, and uh, execute as needed. So we always trained. We did a lot of different things. We never. We were stood up a couple times because they thought some stuff was gonna go down, but we never executed the fact that the Marines always let down. So I kept it to, I was always told the Marines, I'm gonna keep it 100, right? To what you got. They're like, when we're going to war, that's all they want. They wanna go to war, right? All these young dudes, they want war, but they don't know what war is, right? Until, the, until they, they face it, right? And I was like, I tell you guys, like, I, I, and I told him like, look, I didn't do any combat, crazy combat stuff. I didn't uh, combat action or anything like that. But you know, I, I deployed to the combat areas. I seen some what some of my buddies have gone through. Like you guys don't want that. You guys don't want that because it, it, the, what, the hardship that comes with it is what really hurt. And I can tell you that my buddies, they wish they never went through that stuff because it just the the effects, the long lasting effects that comes with with, with combat. Um, and they're like, no, fuck that first. I don't want to go to war. I want to kill motherfuckers. I'm like, relax, relax, guys. And uh, so, you know, we were getting set up and I'm like, hey, guys, we'll bring them in. Like, hey, guys, got bad news. We ain't going nowhere. They're like, fuck you first. You know, I'm like, <laughs> god damn it, you're bursting our bubbles and shit. Like, come on, guys. Let's just keep training. We'll do our thing. I'll be all right. But, you know, every time we're, we're once a uh, week, we will have a, a company formation, and oh, here comes first on to fucking burst our bubble that we're not going to war and shit. <laughs> I just fuck with them so much when they came to that. It was hilarious. <laughs> oh man. Yeah, so I come back from that deployment, and I get orders to uh, literally five weeks later, I get orders to uh, Expeditionary Warfare Training Group Pacific in Coronado, which is a Navy command, but it's made up of a half of Marines. And uh, they raid a first round there, right? So obviously not deployed to the schoolhouse. We do a lot of uh, a lot of the instructors that they train, um, uh, which is like TACP, uh, JFO courses, uh, things like McQuist that come through there as well. And then the, our our biggest money maker is the uh, all the boat uh, boat raids. So all the uh, all the companies that are boat companies that go to on the 31st Mew on that UDP, they all have to come through us to, for a boat package and uh, go through the Coxwinds, uh, Coxwind courses, uh, Marnav, things like that. So they, they do the individual uh, courses first and then at the end they do the company collective uh, raid course and then EOTG certifies them to obviously that they're good to go to go forth on the UDP and then obviously they're we're utilizing that they know what to do but it's awesome you know i go out there and i see those marines like what was it uh two days ago i went out there they were doing the uh the swim screener and it was cold as shit it was on monday you know worst day to do a, a swim screener on the bay in coronado right and those marines are hurt and they're just shaking after they get out of the water so and i see the the first arms out there the, their company first arm and they're like yo come on first arm and i'm like i like this dude just, you know he's doing his thing but he he went through, I was like, yeah, all right, no doubt. So I told uh, my instructors, I'm like, hey, when you guys do the next company course uh, in June, I'm gonna get out in the water, which is a lot warmer, you know? And they're like, why you don't do it right now for something? I was like, nah, it's too cold. <laughs> yeah, wow. So my intent is uh, hopefully come October, I'll be a Star Major Select, so I'll do that, that stand. My intent is just do one tour, so that'll take me to 21 years and change by the time that's all said and done. Um, 
what I plan on doing, I plan on, uh, I want to get my master's in business. So there's that master's of, Bu- for business, uh, master's of Business for Veterans program that USC offers. I plan on applying for that. Hopefully I get accepted and going through that cohort and uh, getting my master's degrees in business. Uh, my intent is I, I want to open up a barbershop. I want to run a barbershop. I don't really want to cut hair. I just want to run it. And, um, and, and you know, I have a vision as regards to how I want it to be. Um, and I think the, the Marine Corps offers, offers so much programs out there that a, a lot of, or just the, the DOD in general, all the services that a lot of service members don't take, don't take it for granted. Um, especially with the whole SkillBridge program. There's probably thousands of companies that are involved in this program that you could be an intern for, for any company that you want for a month, three months, four months, six months out of, uh, out of separating or retiring. And then you could be offered a job, basically. So... There, this program is out there for anyone, right? Like I was a guest speaker at uh, at the BMW Skill Bridge that's over in Camp Pendleton. It's a 16 week long course, four months, right? You go through the extensive training that any civilian will probably pay 180k to go through this thing. That is for free for any service member that wants to do it and fulfill a career as a BMW tech. You come right there with so much insight, just when it comes to vehicles and just BMW overall, that it's a powerhouse when it comes to the automotive industry. And you can work for them in any BMW in the country or in the world, basically, and makes great money doing that. And again, it's free. That uh, you can't beat that. And and it just boggles my mind that so many service members don't take advantage of these services that the DOD has poured so much money into it because they saw what happened to all the Vietnam vests, to all the Gulf War vests, to even the early on GWAT vests that they were given the proper tools to transition properly at the Marine Corps or just any service that they were lost once they, they came, you know, they, they got out there like, what do we do now? They don't have that structure like, hey, let me hold your hand and tell you what to do. Because I think that's where we fail as a service or just all the services that we coddle our service members too much in regards to like where to be, what to do, how to wash your hands, how to fold your laundry. It's just too much. We don't give them the tools like, hey, be a man, be a woman, do your own thing, right? So when they get out, they're like, uh, staff sergeant, first sergeant, lieutenant, captain is not telling me what to do. Like, uh, I don't know, right? But that's what these services are there for, to teach you, those, give you those tools to get you ready to, tr- to transition out and, and, and uh, um, be independent, right? Be civilian. At the end of the day, the goal for all the services is to make better citizens, right? We all come from all walks of life. We all did whatever we did before we came in the Marine Corps or any service. But on the way out, hey, we produce a better product. We will hope, hopefully we did. But the, 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 the truth is that not all come out a better product, right? Some individuals come out worse than what they came in and they tarnish the reputation of those services, especially the Marine Corps. So, but I think nine out of 10 times we do give our better product back into society to give into that site. At the end of the day, the, the service member is a different breed from the regular civilian. We would We will give, I think, increased by tenfold any organization out there, any company, uh, when it comes to production. I, I, I honestly believe, and I think that is true, and it's factual. There has to be facts out there in regards to that. So again, I, I encourage any member that's retiring, getting out there three, four, whatever many years, seek out these programs. They're out there. They're out there. It doesn't matter. There's so many of them. It's insane that you go crazy reading into how many they are. And, uh, and you will learn something from it. So please utilize it. Yeah, nice. Well, we're going to wrap it up. Um, any last words? No, I mean, uh, I, I, Josh, I think this, this is a great platform where you're doing, man. I honestly thank you for bringing me on. I know, you know, I'm not no combat hero, but hopefully what the things I've said here will hopefully relate to someone that's out there that's watching and, and I just help out. And uh, again, I, I thank you for what you do, man. And, um, and you know, I... I just love, I love what I do. I love being a Marine, and I, but I am looking forward to uh, obviously starting a new chapter in my life. But to all those out there, hey, just keep grinding, stay hungry, and just continue to, to, to succeed. Just get after it. Yeah. Don't, let it. don't let it fade. Yeah, thanks for being here, Alex. Thanks for being vulnerable enough to come down here and share your story. Um, you know, Urban Ballard is not a platform just for combat heroes. It's for uh, everybody that's uh, um, chosen to sacrifice any portion of their time to serve our country. So... Um, thanks, brother. Appreciate it. No, thank you, brother. I appreciate you. Semper Fi. Rah.
That make my mind scared Hold me hostage and they don't fight fair Who gon' pray for me and wipe on my tears Who gon' save me if you not right here Move this darkness and make my sight clear Take me your way cause I don't like here Ghost of my past, they feeling the night air Wake me up, I'm trapped in my nightmares